So here's a question for you. Can record labels and artists make a living in a world where music is basically free? That's what we look at here on The Future of What, where we talk about the business side of the recording industry. I'm Portia Sabin, host of The Future of What and president of the independent label Kill Rock Stars. On the last episode of The Future of What, several of our guests mentioned the word licensing and talked about how getting a good license can make all the difference to an artist's income in a given year. Today, we're going to explain what this means. What is a license? Who does it and how? We'll unpack the difference between master and sync rights, and we'll delve a bit into the mysterious world of music publishing. But first, I'd like to welcome Justin Ringel to the studio. Justin is the singer and songwriter of the Portland band Horse Feathers. They currently have a song getting a lot of play on Spotify. It's called A Heart Arcane. Take a listen. Justin Ringel, welcome to the future of what? Hi there. How are you? I'm doing well. Oh, good. So, you started Horse Feathers back in 2004, and you just released your fifth album. Can you tell us how long it took before you could quit your day job? <laughs> um, let's see. I did not, I was not capable of quitting my day job until. And I put that in brackets and quotations because I I worked after I started to make money playing Mm -hmm. music for a brief period of time. But um, it took me about four years, I would say. About 2008 is when I stopped where I became like a full-time musician. Right. A career musician. Yes. That's amazing. So we had Hutch Harris of the Thermals on the program last time, and I asked him the same question. How have your income streams changed over the time that you've been in the band? When I first started, or first started to actually make income, let me say that, uh, <laughs> it was primarily based on physical sales and royalties. And then along the line, just as what you know, the topic of the show is, uh, licensing became a big part of that and getting some syncs for commercials and that kind of stuff. And then it's kind of obviously the, the like the bu- the buzz thing when I first started was like the iTunes download. Digital music was starting to like be like the real income stream. Uh, it wasn't just physical sales. It was the the iTunes download or being able to download something online and pay for it. And then that has since changed to now what seems to be more of a streaming model while the physical sales are kind of diminishing. Right, yeah. as we unfortunately all know. What role did touring play at that in in the early days? Sure. Touring touring has always been funny, a funny thing for for me personally because I'm a it's I'm kind of the primary singer songwriter and I have had to hire musicians to play with me on tour, so I have a lot of income that goes out right. in the touring business where ultimately it kind of ends up being more of a promotional method for me to then kind of recoup that money or make money then from record sales that have, you know, kind of occurred because of the interest from the tours. That's kind of traditionally how it's been. I do make money on tours, but it's it's it takes like a particular type of um, scenario where we don't have to travel. We're not traveling forever or like long distances or, for instance, like flying to Europe and having like tons of overhead definitely changes the bottom line for me as the like kind of sole proprietor and entrepreneur of the group. Right. And that's <clears throat> real different from what we heard from Hutch because, of course, Hutch is in a band with three members, so and they're always the same three members. So right. whatever money comes into them, I'm sure they just, you know, they split it according to their thing. Sure. But for you, you're the dollars and cents guy. You collect all the money. Then you have to hand it out right? based on whatever agreements you have with whoever. Sure. I mean, how many lineups has Horse Feathers had now in the last 10 years? Oh, I think we'd have to... To, to accurately to, to accurately talk about the number, you might have to use an exponent. It's a, I don't remember what an exponent. Uh, yeah, is. I mean it'd be like it'd be like five to the second power or something. I, I I don't even know lineups. I mean maybe in terms of players. I mean we're 
probably in the environment of like I've probably had between ten and fifteen people play with me over the years. This is like the the majority of the the musicians colony of Portland yeah, has played at, in horse at, at some, some point. point. <laughs> at some point. Yeah. So you, as you say, are very in touch with the dollars and cents that you bring in. So given that, what's your sense of these new income streams like Spotify, the dreaded Spotify? I am going to completely out myself here because I did not know until recently, as you know. (laughs) And I had done an interview on the Huffington Post about Spotify. Taylor Swift thing kind of blew up and she pulled her catalog from Spotify. Well, I did not know. And my assumption was that it was zero. But come to find out, I have been making money from Spotify over the last three years. So obviously that changes my opinion about it a little bit. (laughs) However, I do think that there are some kind of weird hitches to that situation. I am in a unique position now, given that I feel like I was in the industry at the point, like maybe the last gasp of physical sales or where that was important. And so now seeing the difference Mm -hmm. is is interesting. You know, it could be artist friendly, Mm -hmm. potentially, but I don't really think it is it is yet. I don't think it's like a really positive business model for musicians. Right. It certainly can be, but you hear all these horror stories of it not. You know, like the recent there was a recent thing about that artist who had like uh four some ungodly number, like forty million streams of some song, but like he only personally actually made like three thousand dollars or something oh, like yeah. that. But I'm assuming that's a vastly different situation than like us or like me as an indie, you know, indie artist. Right. Probably because most of his songs are co-written or have you know, like some kind of major label like involvement. involvement that is like where, yeah, he might only be netting $3,000, but th- there is an actual gross amount right. of money that's being made. Right. Where it's like uh, as an indie artist, it's probably, you know, it's a quite different thing. Right. And can you speak, since you brought it up, a little bit to being an indie artist? I mean, what does that mean in terms of your connection to your money? I didn't know this getting into it. I thought I'd just be writing songs and playing shows. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it, I've kind of gotten some major lessons in, in business and, uh, and what it is to be like a small business owner, really, to a degree. Right. And, and that, that is a weighty concept. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, how long would you say it took you to figure out that you actually were like the proprietor of a small business? It, that kind of dropped on me when I really started to have to pay taxes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Taxes. Taxes. That... And so that was actually when you made money. Right. And, and you know, it, none of these things were clear when, <laughs> when each year was in the red. Right. It just seemed like, oh, I'm playing music and, you know, following my dream. Right. Kind of thing. But as soon as there was any any money, then... There's that, you, you know, you have your booking agent, but there is the, the deadliest agent of all, and that's the IRS agent. <laughs> they, they want their percentage, too. And, and, um, and they're not going to stop. Like, they're not just going to be nice and let you slide. No, they're gonna not at all. They're going to show up. They're going to show up or even or, or audit you. Or audit you. Oh, my I God. I just got audited last year. Oh, so my was, God. And it's really fun to explain your deductions in in an IRS audit as a as a musician because they don't believe that you can possibly make money playing music. Right. They asked me no less than ten times if I had another job. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's actually really fascinating mm-hmm. because that just sort of speaks to how our culture does not see music as a viable business op- option. And actually, that right. could be. One of the reasons why what I was going to say was, you know, other artists seem to not really necessarily get it, Mm -hmm. that being a musician is being a business owner. Definitely. And I think it's because in our culture, we just, you know, we see them as two completely separate things. Like musicians are artists. They're out there living in a garret and Mm -hmm. making beautiful things and Mm -hmm. not being concerned with stuff like taxes. Right, right. Well, I I think that part of it is, is... um... I'm going to kind of dub myself as like part of this group that is the unicorn in the music industry, really. And that's to be like a middle class musician. I think it's the conception is, is you're either a starving artist or you are enormous. Right. Like you're you're famous. Lady Gaga. Right. Exactly. And so it's it's really funny because when you tell people that you're a musician, I have to foreshadow a little bit and say like, I'm a professional musician. Like (laughs) I'm, I'm... I 
my job is making music, and that's, or rather, that's how I make money. Right. Because normally people automatically assume if you tell them what you, you like the name of your group or your name, and they don't know what it is, they assume that you're in the, the first category, the starving category. Right. And it's like, no, you know, like there is a middle class, but it's, I think it's a pretty small one. And I think it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to be in there. That's so funny. I remember in uh, 2001 telling an 18-year-old about this band called Slater Kinney. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, well, I've never heard of them, but I'm sure I will when they make a name for themselves. Right. And they had just sold 90,000 records. Right, right. You know, so we have a very weird idea in this country. Which like was probably— a huge gap yeah, between, you totally. know, being— And, and 90,000 records in 2000 probably wasn't, like, right. totally crazy. <laughs> you know, like, now that would be, like, just this smash hit. Yeah. You know? You would be Lady Gaga if you sold 90,000 to- records. Totally. <laughs> I mean, does she even sell 90,000 records, like, in a, not in a debut week? That's for sure. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. But. Do you want to tell us about that great year that you had when you licensed nine songs to the California Dairy Board? Yeah, that was that was pretty uh, life changing. All of a sudden, it was like going from, you know, I was I was squeaking by. I didn't have to work a job anymore. But all of a sudden, there was like kind of a what to me you could have said it was a million dollars. Right. You know what I mean? And I mean it wasn't, but it it was it was enough money to where it was like. That's the thing that put me in the black for real, and I had to really start to account for the business um, and the taxes, the taxation right. for it. And it was actually quite scary because, I mean, I have a degree in art. You know, <laughs> I, I didn't take a single business class in in um, school. I had no idea really where to start with that. You know, like starting to have an accountant for the first time is, you know, it it was just seemed all very real and very grown up. You know, right. all of a sudden, I'm like, it's not just, you know, playing playing a wooden instrument in front of people and singing. <laughs> it was like adding numbers up and, and like really trying to account for things and like strategically planning when you buy instruments, you know, or, Ooh, or gear and stuff. It's right. like, oh, it's year end. Right. You know, it's, you know, and like thinking like a small business owner kind of. Right. But but yeah, that was that was great. I haven't had anything quite as significant as that since, but little bits and pieces and it's all part of the pie. It's all part of how I make a living is to just, you know, we'll randomly get some little thing where they want to use 30 seconds of a song and some indie film for screening and they'll, you know, they want to give you like $1,000 here and $1,000 there. And it's not like the um, huge, like, you know, payday of like a big campaign or anything like that. Like that particular thing was like several commercials, but... It's all part of the the pie in terms of like how I actually managed to do this magic trick and <laughs> make a living playing music. So just to uh, clarify for the audience, the California Dairy Board situation was a series of commercials for the California Dairy Board about, you know, milk and farmers and cows and things. Mm-hmm. And they used parts of at least nine of your songs. That's I, right. I think mm-hmm. that's right. And it went over quite a while. I mean, several months, I think, yeah, the they, campaign. Yeah, they went ended for. up, I think they renewed it twice. And, yes, too. they renewed it twice. And mm-hmm. that was another thing that's amazing about licensing because if you do, mm-hmm. or if you're lucky enough to get some of your music placed in something mm-hmm. and then they use it over and over, sure. you just get paid again and again. Right. Which is great. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> we have no problem with that. Yeah. Okay. So now, because part of the mission of the show is to be educational and help people understand what the heck we all do here. All right. Can you tell us the difference between the master side and the sync side of a song? Certainly. Okay. I've, I've learned this the, the hard <laughs> way, actually. Um, and when you record a song and say, like, in our arrangement, and I say you, Portia Saban, being the president of Kill Rock Stars, you sign a contract and the label owns the master rights, which is the recording of that particular song. Correct. The concept of the song, that typically belongs to the writer, and that is the thing that people will refer to as the sync side. Correct. So, for example, a song that Horse Feathers writes sure. that is on Kill Rock Stars, let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say, let's just take A Hard Arcane. If, let's say, Dawn Dishwashing Liquid were to uh, license that song, mm-hmm. there would be a sync side and a master side. And Kill Rock Stars would get paid for the master side because That's we right. own the master recording. Mm-hmm. And you, Justin Ringel, would get paid for the sync side. That's right. 
And because we have a 50-50 deal, which is a mm -hmm. profit share deal, which is what indie labels tend to have, you'll get 50% of that half that I got, and exactly. you'll get 100% of the half that you got. So of the total 100%, you'll end up with 75%. That's right. That's the... That's right. the way it works. This is these are the facts. Mm -hmm. Like this is stuff that no songwriter, when they sit down at fourteen years old to write a song about Kitty in the Corner with a Sad Green Eyes, which I wrote when I was fourteen years mm -hmm. old, <laughs> has no clue. Right? I have right. no clue that I am writing something that has both a master side and a sync side, and within right. the sync side, all these other rights. Well, you can give yourself some credit because people who are also in their thirties and forties <laughs> don't know that either. <laughs> It's, there's a pretty steep learning curve to this stuff, and it took me quite a while of, like, having to deal with it in action. Right. You know what I mean? Like, actually, situationally, to understand it in any way. So, with all that excitement in mind, what advice would you give a young musician just starting out? <laughs> <laughs> or would you just be like, later? Yeah. <laughs> Got nothing I, to say. Yeah. I don't know. Currently, I'd say maybe wait it out a minute. <laughs> We had this conversation in the van recently. We were all talking about that, the kind of that thing, like if we had a kid and they were like, Dad, I want to be a musician. I, I, It's hilarious because I'd probably be like, no, son, you're going to be a lawyer. Ah. Get your, get a degree in business, right. um, which is so, is so funny because I just like totally did not listen to that from my parents. Of course. Yeah. In terms of advice, I think that, well, let me put it this way. If you want to just be an artist and play music, you can, you don't have to leave your home. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, right. you can, you can play music and, and you can scratch the itch of artistic expression from, you know, the comfort of your own basement uh -huh. and you can record it and that can be one thing, but you know, no one ever wants to do that. They, as soon as they're going, they play publicly, that in essence means that they do indeed want to make money. Right. I mean, I think that that's kind of the delineation. So if that's really what you want to do and you want to make money, it's very wise to figure out the business details and, and the understanding of all these things that we we're talking about from the very beginning. And I mean, I, I, I think tons of musicians would say this, but if I would have done that or been a little bit wiser, I would be you know, tens of thousands of dollars richer, you uh -huh. know, not like hundreds or millions, <laughs> you know, but like, you know, I, I would definitely have more money in my pocket. And does everyone in the van call you dad? They do. <laughs> they definitely do. <laughs> I can totally tell. Yes. <laughs> That's Justin Ringel of the band Horse Feathers in studio with me on the future of what? Justin helped us understand that there are two sides to every song, master and sync, when it comes to licensing. But what about the sync side itself, otherwise known as the publishing side of a song? How many parts does that part of a song have? Carrie Ann Marshall is partner at Songs Music Publishing, and she's going to help us figure this one out. Carrie Ann, welcome to the future of what? Hello. Thanks for having me today. We're so glad to have you. This is Justin Ringel I'm speaking to here. Hi there. From the Hello. band Horse Feathers. Hello. We've been Hello. talking about four of Horse Feathers albums are on Kill Rock Stars, so I own the master side of his stuff. So when he gets a sync license, I, you know, mm -hmm. they clear the master side with me and the sync side with him. But what I wanted um, you to touch on is there's actually the sync side itself has some component parts, right? Isn't there sort of songwriter parts and then also publishing parts? Oh, sure. Um, basically, publishing is, is sort of like a pie. We look at it that way. Half of the pie is kind of the songwriter share, and the other half is the publisher share. And depending on the type of deal that one does, that can be divided a number of ways. At Songs, we traditionally do co-publishing deals in which we pay for the rights for half of the publisher share. So in essence, that's 25% of the entire pie. Right. Makes sense, sort of? It yeah. does. And this is, you know, sort of the theme <laughs> of today is licensing. And then the sub theme uh -huh. is how does anyone understand this? This is crazy. I think I worked in the music business for five or six years before I even understood what publishing was. <laughs> See, we um, were talking about that. Nobody knows. Seriously. 
No, nobody. I didn't know until I started working at a music publishing company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in that part, it, hopefully, if you are, um, you know, in the hands of of somebody who knows what they're doing, they can handle all that accounting for you. You know, a, a, if you sign um, to a publisher, they're going to be able to explain and do the, all the accounting and everything for you. In fact, that's one of the advantages with signing with a publishing company is they handle all that administration for you. If we're talking about a band let's say, that does a licensing deal with the company, they won't be administering the publishing most of the time. They're just going to be taking a administration fee, perhaps, on the publishing side if they're representing the publishing or master side if they're representing the master in exchange for providing those services. They're not going to co-own the actual rights and do that, you know, back-end administration. But what you mentioned when you said a co-publishing deal, you guys would actually mm-hmm. co-own the rights for a Correct. certain period of time? Mm-hmm. So then can you give us an overview of what, let's say you enter into a co-publishing deal with Justin for Horse Feathers. Yep. What Mm -hmm. would you guys then do? A full service publishing company entails quite a few things. Basically, it would be registering the songs collecting any any monies for your mechanical synchronization, um, making sure everything's accounted correctly, also providing services like A&R services as well as synchronization. I mean, it's really everything you can imagine that is part of your songwriter world. We don't, you know, as a publisher, we're representing the songwriter. We're not representing the artist, even if it's the same person. That makes sense. Sure. So basically everything, all the accounting and all this, all the creative support for the songwriter portion. So perhaps giving feedback on on songs or notes if if a band is getting ready to record an album, you know, obviously pitching songs for film and television commercials and doing all the accounting that goes along with any record sales or downloads or synchronization. So help us understand this. Let's say you guys find a young artist or a new artist that you want to work with. What do you give them in exchange for their publishing rights? I mean, you've given us, you're you're pretty much, publishers are extremely helpful in this situation because clearly the accounting on the back end of this is is pretty confusing if you had to do it yourself. So what is it that you guys give to artists up front? There's always an advance. And that's negotiable. And we feel like, I mean, I'm in a little bit of a different position. I used to work at a major publishing company. I now work at an independent music publishing company because I prefer to be more hands-on with our songwriters. There are great, great things about big publishing companies, too. I just like to roll up my sleeves and, and really get to know my writers very, very well, all of my writers. And we sort of feel like when we enter into a publishing agreement with a new songwriter, we feel like we're partners with them. Publishing is kind of a big deal. Um, it's it's almost like real estate in some ways. So to, in a sense, sell part of the publishing to us, we want to make sure that we can really provide a high level of service. So there's an advance um, and there's a negotiation that takes place. I removed myself from that on purpose. And then uh, once we enter into an agreement, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do. I can kind of d- dig in a little bit, but, you know, my team, which is the synchronization team, likes to sit with any new writers that we sign and, and go over a plan or strategy. And Part of that usually happens before we even sign the writer to make sure we really truly can add value. As a small company, we're not trying to just sign everything we can. That doesn't make sense for us. Uh, we really want to make sure that we can add value. And certainly from where I sit, I never know which songs are going to get licensed or uh, what the landscape is going to look like from a licensing point of view. But I do know what um, music supervisors are going to be asking for in the moment. I mean, that changes too. Um, and I do, uh, you know, my team and I work really, really hard. So we want to make sure that we feel like we're partners and our interests are aligned with our writers. So once our writers get signed and have that negotiation, get in advance, are signed to us, uh, the rights are exchanged, we really try to to set up a game plan for synchronization. You know, of course, they also sit with A&R Creative Services to get the the co-writing or songwriting or that portion of their business, you know, aligned uh, as far as the strategy is concerned as well. So how do you guys go about finding new talent? Well, we have an A&R department, and they're always looking for writers that they think will fit at our company. 
as I mentioned before, we're not just trying to sign everything. That doesn't make sense for us. We really want to make sure we can add value. So we think about how, how that will fit in, how the writer will fit in with our current roster. You know, and some of it's word of mouth. I, I've, uh, we've signed a handful of bands or writers who have come to us because of either referrals or they've, they're friends with bands. One of them we signed a, a few years ago was on tour with another band that signed to us and kind of emailed me blindly and said, you know, can, can we set up a meeting? I mean, it really, really depends. That's Carrie Ann Marshall, partner at Songs Music Publishing. Carrie Ann, thanks so much for joining us on The Future of What? Oh, my pleasure. Nice talking to you both. Welcome back to The Future of What, the show that explores the ins and outs of the music industry. I'm Portia Sabin. We're talking music licensing on this episode, and we're going to talk now to the person who actually selects music for the Comedy Central show Broad City. Music, of course, is key to the show, like in this scene where the main characters, Abby and Alana, discuss going to a Little Wayne concert. Abby, Abby, Abby. No joke. Today is the day we become Abby and Alana, the boss bitches we are in our minds. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Awesome. Are you done? Is that the whole thing? Obviously, I have a plan. Tonight, we are going to see a secret pop-up Lil Wayne concert at Bowery Ballroom. You and I can't. I'm so broke. No excuses, girl. I'm getting big old balls on my today. today. Get it. Carter. You're going to have to speak in English for me. I'm getting my paycheck today, and I can spot you, bitch. I wish that I could, but I'm so close to finishing season one of Damages, and I made this, like, amazing cashew stir-fry for the week, so I'm actually pretty booked. Stir-fry? Can I talk to the Abby who stole a van? Ab, you're so stuck in your little routine. I bet you schedule in your jack The guy behind the music in those scenes is Matt F.X. Feldman. Matt's the music supervisor for Broad City, and he joins us now from New York. Matt, welcome to the future of what? Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Matt, I think our listeners would find this interesting. Can you tell us how old you are? Yes, I am 23 years old as of February 1st. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's awesomely young. I love it. Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> you're in charge of picking the music on one of the hottest shows on TV right now. So how often do musician friends of yours beg you to get their songs on the show? Um, my friends have stopped begging, actually. They, <laughs> they, they just know that if the song's right, I'll come to them. But it's the like, you know, it's the friends of friends of friends. Uh, and that's that's like two emails a day, three Facebook requests a day, I'd say, on average. Right. No doubt. Oh my uh, gosh. Two thirds of which usually works out for something, I'd say. Uh, more than people expect, I think. Yeah, I think people are probably pretty interested in how you do go about picking music for the show. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, the process changes with every episode, with every editor. Um, ultimately, there's a ton of music I'm downloading and just trying to understand as quickly as possible. And then I'm importing it into the editor's, you know, computers and uh, uh, network. And then, in, you know, we're sometimes it's it's as complicated as like, you know, just throwing things at a wall and seeing what'll stick. And sometimes it's like, oh, this scene. Yeah, of course, this song and just throwing it right in and it working on the first try. Uh, you know, it's never the same twice. And how much input do Abby and Alana have in the music? Um, they have absolute veto power. They have any song that they wanted to use, they just throw right in. Uh, and, you know, in general, their tastes are spot on. I mean, like, I'm really trying my hardest to kind of tailor my taste to theirs, if you will. Uh, like, definitely the music that's on the show represents a large portion, almost like a Venn diagram, if you will, of like their taste and mine in the middle ground. Uh, I'd say. Uh, but no, they, they contribute a ton, a ton to the process. So at 23 years old, how did you get this job? Because it seems like kind of a dream job for, for someone, well, of any age, but definitely at 23. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a long story, but ultimately boils down to uh, me having a crush on a girl in senior year of high school, showing that girl skins, through a crazy series of events, getting the opportunity to choose the music for American Skins through one of that aforementioned girl's best friends. 
and then not doing anything for a few years, music supervision related. I was DJing and throwing parties and writing music and then getting a call from uh, the assistant editor on Broad City, who was the same guy on American Skins, saying, hey, uh, we might have trouble with our current music guy. It's this new show. It's going to air in a month and a half. Would you mind coming in and playing them some music off your computer? Wow. Uh, and I came in and I played them some music. And, and with both shows, actually, with Skins and Broad City, it was like, the question was, can I make them a playlist and could they try me out for a couple days? And then I, I was hired by the end of the week, basically, on both uh, both scenarios. That's fantastic. You know, that's weird. We have a weird connection because I used to manage this band called The Gossip that had the theme song on UK skins. Oh, yeah. Wow. The Gossip <laughs> are incredible. I've seen them. I've seen them a couple times. They're they're amazing. Beth Ditto is an icon. She is. She is. And that was uh, that was when I was managing them. We got them that um, that sync so that was really yeah that, that sync was a big one that especially for the united kingdom in general that that uh that commercial that first skins commercial that was that was a big big one mm-hmm. yeah it was a game changer i think yeah that was that was like the the project x pursuit of happiness HX <laughs> remix sync before the project x HX <laughs> so why do you think that that sync in the uk for the gossip was such a big deal it's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it was just the combination of, of music to picture and and having that sort of crazy party atmosphere. Um, the hook is so energetic and magnetic, and uh, it, it just feels like a slam dunk sink. You know, it's you know you see that scene once, and regardless of whether or not you hate that party or want to be at that party, like the music's right. You know, it's working. It just works incredibly. And for that to air as a commercial on on television. Uh, you know, must have been pretty insane. I, I remember British people I know telling me about the first time they saw that commercial on television and how that they were just like, what is this show? I need to watch it, you know? So you and I know what that um, what that trailer looked like. But yeah. for people listening at home who don't, can you describe it? I said it's sort of like the Fiona Apple criminal video in that it had that – it was film quality, not video. Yeah, it's a film quality video of a house party uh, opening up on like a candy-colored raver kid with blonde hair biking around a room in a tricycle, like a like a kid's tricycle with like a fur jacket and no shirt. Your back's against the wall. There's no one home to call. Keep forgetting who you are. Cut to kids doing jugs in the bathroom. Cut to girls in a pillow fight. Like, just total madness. Uh, somehow managed to get every character who shows up in the first season to just kind of cameo in the scenes. But it was an ad, so you really had no idea who was in the show and who wasn't. Uh, writing lipstick on mirrors. I'm trying to figure out. I haven't seen the video in years, but those are the images that are in my head. And, you know, that actually was a turning point in the gossip's career, too, because... That came out, like, that trailer came out on in, like, February they started air, airing it. And uh-huh. um, in March, the gossip went gold in the U.K. on the radio charts. And the, and the reason was because they added downloads for the first time. And that song was downloaded so much that it actually put the song at number seven on the radio charts, even though it wasn't being played on the radio. I believe it. Yeah. I, I, I 100% believe it. So now Broad City is a huge hit for Comedy Central. But, of course, the show still has to make the network some money. So um, when you're picking music, do you just go ahead and pick the music that you like and not worry about how much it costs and let somebody else work out the cost? Oh, I wish. I wish. Uh, it's, 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 it's almost the opposite. I'm in a really fortunate position having spent a few years DJing and throwing parties that I've met a lot of incredibly talented producers and bands and musicians who don't have label support, don't have publishing support. Uh, but produce incredibly good music. And, you know, some of these guys have publicists, have, have released remix on dance labels and things like that, but, you know, they don't, they don't have that, like, man in a suit upstairs telling them that they can't take the opportunity unless it's five grand. So they're down to do it. You know, they're down to put their music on a show on a low budget. So in that case, it's, yes, it's, I, I'm putting on music from producers that I like. Um, but I don't even think in terms of music, like, from bands that I know, for like, you know, from... from uh, famous bands and artists like I, I i try to stay away from that as much as possible just so i know that we can come in on budget and uh, but occasionally you must have a situation where you, 
where there's just one song that's like we absolutely have to have the Beatles oh, version sure. of and, whatever. And, and a lot of those situations are the girls, um, right? And, you know, and and then that's it. And when it's the girls and they like a song, it's like of course we'll we'll do everything we can to get it. Um, Drake, for example, you know, was the girl's choice. They filmed the scene to that song, the the started from the bottom. And uh, it was like a week, week, week in, you know, six week, nine week process of figuring out whether or not we were going to get the song. But that was something where, you know, every favor, every, you know, I remember Lana telling me that she was like, well, Jake's in SNL this weekend. I'm going to try to go to SNL. And I don't even remember if she did or not. But like that was the air in the office. Like, what are we going to do to get this song? Right. That's well, that's pretty exciting. That's a pretty fun job. Um, so now do you have any advice if you had, you know, young friends come to you and say, man, I want to be a music supervisor. Do you have any advice or how to go about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been asked the question a few times and, and again, like I'm so grateful and fortunate to have gotten the opportunity to do it kind of serendipitously. Um, I know that New York and LA are the two hotbeds for music supervision. Uh, I know that there's also a lot of shows that come out of Atlanta, though I don't really know the details of that. I just know that, you know, I've been trying to get into cartoons myself. I'd love to choose music for cartoons and it seems like a lot of them are produced down there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, send emails, just send emails and, and be nice and, and try to get yourself in the room somehow and, you know, try to take the odd road. Don't necessarily just email a music supervisor, email, email, a, you know, a TV director, email a writer, email, you know, you never know. You really never know. Um, the skins thing came across because a friend of a friend literally emailed Brian Elsley and was like, let me be your intern. And he said, yes. So you, you just never know. Keep but trying. I think, and that the funny part is, you know, I mean, we're trying to be helpful on this show and, and help people out, but a lot of life really is like that. It's very serendipitous. Definitely. Absolutely. So, Matt, thank you so much for joining us here on The Future of What? Absolutely. Thank you. That was Matt F.X. Feldman, music supervisor for Broad City. Stay with us as we talk to someone who is responsible for the placement of music in movie trailers, another important and highly visible opportunity for artists. Coming up next on The Future of What? We're going to go now to Sorab Nafisi of Warner Brothers Records. Sorab is the executive director of music and legal for Warner Brothers. He joins us from the studios of KCRW in Los Angeles. Sorab, thanks for joining us here on The Future of What? Good morning. How are you? So you license music for movie trailers, which I would imagine yes, I do. makes you the most sought-after man in the universe. No, um, <laughs> sort of. So, uh, no. Until they realize that I'm not a music supervisor and I don't pick the music that goes into the trailers. Mm. I just, what happens is, um, so I work for Warner Brothers Pictures Theatrical Marketing. Right. And we are responsible for the marketing campaigns of all the first run theatrical releases at the studio, everything that we produce and everything that we distribute. What I do is whenever there's any music and sound design in any trailer or advertisement or radio spot or any kind of publicity use. I sit down with the creative director and I sit down with sometimes a music supervisor and I figure out what's in there. And then I go out and I uh, research who owns it and I try to make a deal that's happy, that makes everybody happy so we can use the uh, music in our advertisements. I don't do any of the actual supervision. That right. happens at all the creative, uh, we call them trailer houses, but they're, they're creative vendors that specifically service the motion picture industry. Interesting. So now industry lore has it the trailers still pay the most, or at least the payouts from trailer placements are diminishing the least in the licensing landscape. Is that true? I'd have to say that I've noticed that my fees that I'm paying are going up. Ooh. Um, you, are, you are branding a product that is a film and a studio in the marketplace with somebody else's music, somebody else's copyright. So, you know, it's, it's a very highly visible form of advertising. It's only rivaled by certain very national, sometimes worldwide advertising campaigns. So, yes, it, it exists on the higher tier of uh, payouts, I would suppose. Now, what is your, how does license, do you ever license music directly from an artist? I mean, does that ever happen? Or is it always sort of through a, a label or a publisher? It's uh, completely across the board. I'd say the bulk of everything that I license is either through a major or major indie label or publisher or a sound design production company. But 
oftentimes a significant percentage comes from directly from artists because uh, music supervisors are always competing with each other to find something that somebody else hasn't used before. And oftentimes it comes from their own personal music collections. They're being pitched stuff constantly. And so n not everything that is suitable for advertising is happens to be signed to a major label or publisher. So oftentimes, yes, we, we are dealing with bands directly. So you did not mention indie labels in that list. Indie labels, you know, the thing with indie labels is what I've noticed is they tend to go, much as indie labels tend to go through aggregators for distribution of their music, I've noticed that a lot of indie labels, instead of having in-house people whose sole jobs are to pitch and license music, they tend to go through uh, music licensing companies that specialize in pitching smaller catalogs or specialized catalogs. And so, the, yeah, that's the reason I didn't really say I, I'm hard pressed to think of the last time I dealt directly with an indie label that wasn't also in some way administered by a... Uh, a music licensing company. Oh, yes. But but definitely you deal with the licensing companies that oh, deal with indie labels. Yes. Oh, absolutely. They handle indie yes. Labels. I, yeah. I didn't mean to suggest that the the music that we license isn't released on indie labels. It's just sometimes like when you're dealing directly with people, that's all I meant to say. Sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> no, and I understand what you mean because major labels and I mean that's a big difference. Major labels and major indies tend to have their own licensing departments in-house. Absolutely. Right. And that's a very different scenario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that makes more sense. I was like, oh, my God, we'll never get a song no, and trailer no. as long as I live. <laughs> <laughs> Panic. So can you tell us from your perspective how the licensing landscape has changed in the past 10 years? I feel like there is a greater emphasis on sync licensing in terms of like advertising and film and TV use both in terms of content for TV shows and placement in films. There used to be, I don't you know, the, it used to not be such a an emphasis for the for getting your catalog into these types of programs. Also, in, in part and parcel is the advertising of those things. I feel like in the '90s and even in the early 2000s, it was not if it wasn't an afterthought, it was almost like a stigma. You didn't want to be associated with advertising a brand or whatnot. But now a lot of the major indies and a lot of uh, all these like music licensing companies have sprouted up just to service this part of the industry. I think it's strange in that the fees have gone up. There's a lot more content out there. There's a lot more places for content. So there's a lot more. The pie has gotten bigger, if that makes sense. It's not just, you know, shows that are running on network t TV and cable TV. There's a lot of different content out there and they all need music. One thing that I did feel like was um, people thought that for a long time that sync licensing revenues would sort of re help replace uh, record sales. And I don't know if the math ever made sense for that, but that's still something I hear a lot. There's a lot of expectation to make up with the lack of record sales with, with sync licensing. And um, so that's given a greater emphasis to try to get the artists placed in the right TV programs or, or advertisements as well. Right. And I think that's just the desperation of the industry. I mean, I think, I think we all agree that sync licensing mm -hmm. is more like getting struck by lightning rather than, Absolutely. Yeah, than anything yeah. you could put into your After budget. After you've won the lottery. After you've won the lottery, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, and as Justin, you know, Justin's experience is, you know, he got this, he got this one outstanding sync one year but it really, and that really changed the profile of his income for that year and probably the year after. Mm -hmm. But really, it didn't mm -hmm. change. You know, it, it wasn't something that he could put into his yearly budget. Like, I definitely am going to make, yeah. you know, you can't count on it. Six figures no. from licensing no. this year. <laughs> no, that's pretty impossible. But sorry, one of the you know, things. It, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say it's it's a little interesting in that you know I, I I did catch the tail end of you know the previous segment and. What tends to happen, I see, is like once you get like one little bit of a foothold in sync licensing, like you have one good use, one pro high profile use, sometimes things tend to start rolling from there because, you know, people people tend to go with what they know in terms of music supervision. And so somebody will see you and, you know, oh, I heard this song in the California Milk Board, you know, advertisements. What's that? Maybe I can use that. Or once they're f familiar with a band, Oh yeah, I'm gonna definitely check out their next record. Oh yeah, definitely send it to me when it's uh, you know ready. And 
And sometimes like one decent use can start building on a career in sync. It's, it's, people don't think of, yes, it is like winning the lottery in the sense that it ha- a lot of different things have to fall together in place at the right time to make a use stick and to make a, make a deal happen. But at the same time, people can sort of build sync licensing careers in the sense that people become familiar with your catalog, people know what you sound like, people are comfortable with cutting with you, and they've done business with you in the past, and it leads to more business. And do you think, Saurabh, that there are trends in licensing? Because I feel like, remember, you know, sometimes you get that iconic usage, like remember that VW commercial that used Nick Drake's Mm -hmm. Pink Moon? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then right after that, we just, like the phone was ringing off the hook with people wanting Elliot Smith. Mm -hmm. for commercials and stuff. I mean, it really, I felt like that was a moment when suddenly like, oh, you know, um, depressed singer-songwriters, gotta have them, like, for everything. Do you feel like the licensing world goes through those types of trends? Absolutely. I mean, I think the Nick Drake ad for VW was not only kicked off a particular trend in terms of the style of music that people wanted in ads. But I feel like that was a big bellwether moment in terms of brands using music in advertising period. Because before that, I mean, I think that was the most high, that was a, I think that was like a turning point in sync licensing in terms of like major brands looking for independent artists. And I mean, Nick Drake had been dead for like 20, 30 years at that point. Right. But I think that pretty much resurrected his career. Mm -hmm. Uh, that advertisement you know i have the greatest respect for music supervisors but they are they are working for directors they are working for the showrunners and they are working for the studios that want them to use certain types of things that they hear elsewhere right now a huge thing you know I, i roll my eyes every time i see it and we do a lot of it at warner brothers but everybody's looking for the next big cool cover of a classic song to use in a trailer that just seems everybody's mining their catalogs in terms of publishing to find somebody to make a fresh version of it for a trailer use. And that seems to be a big thing right now. Hmm. Um, You know, a year prior to that, there was a very short-lived infatuation with all things (laughs) pseudo-dubstep. You know, I mean, there was even a, you know, we we did some Pacific Rim TV spots that had essentially like crazy dubstep in it. Two years prior to that, it was, you know, when 2010 came around and Warner Brothers put out the first couple trailers for Inception, that kicked off a whole trend of people doing the low drone blasts, you know, the, the you know, that sort uh-huh. of sound. Like, that's that sort of permeated the rest of the, a lot of the trailer music you heard, you know, you know after that had, you know, referenced that. In many ways. So, yes, there are trends right now. I feel like we're in we're in cover land right now. Wow. That's so interesting. Justin. Yeah. Get out of here and go do some covers. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, which, He's got which, a you know, I, covered, I, you know, I yeah. feel like, <laughs> I know. you know, I feel like in a way I really like that. I, I feel like covers are a prime example of how copyright law is supposed to work and how music is supposed to work. You know, you write a song, you make a recording of it, you inst- the, the, the moment you fix it in a tangible medium, you have the copyright. So later on, decades later, somebody else wants to take your music and reinterpret it and re-release it, and that is a testament to the lasting quality of the music and the intrinsic quality of the music. And notwithstanding the fact that it might be used in an advertisement or created for an advertisement, that's the way, I, I feel like that's that's an example of how legally and it, legally the, the copyright system sometimes works here. It's that, you know, a modern band can take an old song, make a new interpretation of it, and it's out there and people get turned on to the original music. So I, I like that. So um, one thing you said I want to touch on real fast, which was something we also talked about last week, which was this idea of selling out, because it's true. When I got into the music business in the 90s, there was still a really strong sense of you would never want your music to be used in a commercial because that would be Mm -hmm. selling out. And last week we talked to Hutch Harris from the Thermals, who were famous for turning down a Hummer commercial, 
I think they'd been offered $100,000 for it or something. And, and they turned the mm-hmm. money down because they were like, we're not going to support that brand. And I feel like, much like the Nick Drake license, I feel like there was this moment that happened, and I, I think I can put my finger on it. I think it was the Of Montreal song for Outback Steakhouse. Oh, Do you remember yes. that? That like changed I do. everything. Hmm. After that date, it, nobody has ever said the words selling out. I have never heard those. And instead, every band, every young band I know is like, oh, I hope we get a commercial for something. You know, right. I hope I can't wait to sell our music to somebody. Well, I, th- I think that there's a few <laughs> things. I, I think that part, part of that is in the previous part where we were talking. It's, it's because of how physical sales have absolutely disappeared. Right. That it's the only way that a lot of you know, musicians think that they're actually going to make money. So the stigma kind of disappeared with record sales. You know, it was like, oh, well, this is the only way that we could possibly make right. money. So the interest in it has gone up and also the stigma has gone down. You know, like no yeah. one. I mean, I guess wi- widely, I guess in the musical community that I'm in, or just I know people that are always making, they're doing spec stuff or, or licensing music they've already made. And no one talks about it unless it's something about a brand they disagree with because of political reasons or something like that. Like the Hummer thing is a perfect example. Like I wouldn't license to Hummer, you know, because I don't. They're not environmentally conscious or, or whatever. Right. But outside of that, it's total fair game. Some artists just still feel, and that is completely valid, that like any form of advertising is you know anathema to them. They're making music for the sake of making music. Just because you happen to find it and want to use it to sell your product doesn't mean that I have to play along. That attitude is utterly perplexing to everybody in my building that I work with. <laughs> they don't understand if it's in the marketplace in any way, shape, or form, then you should be willing to make a deal for it in some way, shape, or form for use in advertising. And any attitude to the contrary is just not, it's, it goes over their head. So you have some bands that, I, you know, we've, we've uh, most of the time, you know, we can, we can make a deal with an artist, but sometimes no amount of money can change their mind. Some bands don't agree to any advertising whatsoever. Mumford & Sons is a prime example of a band that says no to all advertising. We've tried to use them in some of our materials, and and they've never, to, to my knowledge, they've never said yes to a trailer use at all. Because um, they're in the position that they can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. the thing, the thing with like the thing with record sales is, I will give anybody the benefit of the doubt. It says like I will not license music for advertising because I don't believe in that. I still, my soul is still at the point where I believe a band when they say that. That being said, you know, when you're selling millions of records, um, that's a that's a very lucrative thing. Still, you know, you know, the the profit margin on selling albums is still very good if you're selling a lot of them. Sorab, thank you so much for joining us. Sorab Nafisi Absolutely. is the executive director of music slash legal at Warner Brothers Pictures. Sorab, it was a joy to have you on The Future of What? Anytime. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Bye. If you have further questions about licensing or any other questions you'd like us to answer on air, write to us at thefutureofwhatshow at gmail.com. This show is archived at killrockstars.com backslash thefutureofwhat. Special thanks today to the studios of OPB. This show was engineered by Stephen Cray. The Future of What is produced by Jimbo Sandberg and John Sepulvado of X-Ray FM and me, Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rock Stars. Thanks for listening. <laughs>